The sudden leap in aviation technology after World War I and the onset of World War II was so dramatic that it led the Royal Air Force to believe that any future conflict would be won by air supremacy alone. During the period known as the Phony War, the Royal Air Force launched a daring raid on the crucial naval base at Wilhelmshaven. The objective was to cripple the Kriegsmarine and stop it from engaging Allied supply routes in the Atlantic. As such, 22 Vickers Wellington bombers were suddenly unleashed upon the sheltered German area in the North Sea in December of 1939. The warplanes were tasked with sinking as many German ships in Wilhelmshaven and the area surrounding Heligoland Bight as possible. Emboldened by the British mantra about the bomber always being able to get through, the confident Allied pilots swept into the area, believing the day would result in a decisive victory. Soon, however, the Luftwaffe would unbridle a formidable fleet of Messerschmitt Bf 109 interceptors and force the Royal Air Force to rewrite their aviation combat philosophy for the remainder of the war. Dire Limitations In the days leading to World War II, the Royal Air Force did not have a four-engine bomber with enough defensive capabilities that could also carry heavy bomb loads all the way to most German targets. To limit their capabilities even more, the Netherlands and Belgium made it clear they would remain neutral and therefore refuse the RAF from establishing bases or flying over their countries to reach Germany. During the phony war, when the Western powers were still hoping for a quick and peaceful resolution, the fighting faction, especially France, refused to commit to more significant attacks. They even prohibited the RAF from bombing German cities from French airfields. With so many obstacles in its way, the Royal Air Force was crippled to only fly aircraft directly from British territory, thus limiting their reach to the ports and coastal cities in northern Germany. Even so, the RAF soon embraced the limitations and saw them as an opportunity to avoid an unwanted escalation, while allowing British warplanes to specifically target the Allies' most significant threat, German U-boats. Primary Target At 11.15 a.m. on September 3, 1939, it became clear that Germany would not withdraw its troops from Poland as requested, and Britain declared war. Several U-boats were already at sea, operating in the North Sea, and as the news broke, they began attacking British ships, bringing supplies from North America and other parts of the British Empire. The aggressions reached their zenith when the German submarine U-47 sank HMS Royal Oak at Scapa Flow. Consequently, the Admiralty pushed for the RAF to focus on coastal command rather than a strategic bomber force. Despite a fierce internal debate, with many political factions calling for the bombing of German cities, the RAF decided to adhere to the United States' request to avoid bombing civilian targets. As such, they created the Western Air Plan 7B, calling for air attacks on German warships. Even so, most of Germany's navy was docked at densely populated harbors, and the British refused to strike near such locations to avoid civilian casualties. Nevertheless, by September 18th, the German Navy was moving across the North Sea, away from civilian centers, thus becoming a legitimate target for the RAF, who had the critical priority of destroying any German vessel that could supply U-boats in the Atlantic. A plan. An ambitious plan was concocted based on intelligence gathered by Flying Officer Andrew McPherson of No. 139 Squadron who had spotted a sizable naval force near Wilhelmshaven only a few weeks before. However, the strike on the German vessels was delayed time and time again. At first, it was meant to happen immediately after the pilot made the discovery, but a series of radio malfunctions made the mission launch impossible. During the following weeks, the RAF had to continue tracking the German vessels' movements and assess the ideal moment to unleash the raid. The unpredictability of the German movements and the horrid weather conditions 
pushed the date further back until the morning of December 18th, when the Times of London released the story of the Battle of the River Plate and the destruction of Admiral Graf Spee, which emboldened the British to sink another German warship. That same day, RAF bombers were instructed to overfly the Heligoland Bight, but avoiding civilian assets, merchant shipping, or land itself. The Germans prepare. At the time, the Luftwaffe's air defense system faced numerous challenges, and protecting northern German ports and key strategic targets was assigned to local or nearby air defense commands, such as the Luftverteidigungskommando Hamburg. However, the system was flawed and inefficient, as the Luftwaffe fighters and flak units were too far apart to coordinate effectively. Relations between the Luftwaffe and Kriegsmarine Commanders-in-Chief Hermann Göring and Erich Raeder were also strained, further complicating matters. Both services had to work together to conduct a successful defense, but their relationship was strained. A makeshift solution was implemented by subordinating fighter units on the North Sea coast to the Luftgau Commando 11 in Hanover. These fighter units would function as autonomous fighter flyer leaders under Carl August Schumacher, a former commander with a naval background and combat experience at the Battle of Jutland. It was expected that Schumacher's naval background and easygoing personality would improve cooperation with the Maritime Service. Even so, only one thing was clear. The incoming British raid would put the scarce German air defenses to the test. The Clash The first Wellington bomber took off from RAF Mildenhall with Wing Commander Richard Kellett at the controls, followed by the 9th Squadron from RAF Honington and the 37th Squadron. In total, the British forces were comprised of 22 Vickers Wellington bombers, which, according to British air doctrine, were to fly in a close formation, rendering them essentially unassailable to German fighters. The overconfident British pilots were not that concerned about German fighters, and were more interested in avoiding flak fire, which they saw as the main obstacle to their mission. The plan was to avoid heavy anti-aircraft artillery on the Frisian Islands by flying north and then turning south, dodging the heaviest flak-defended areas. The bombers arrived without interference, but their journey south had given the Germans a one-hour warning, as the Freya radar detected the bombers 30 miles away. As such, the Germans assembled a considerable fighter fleet to intercept the attackers once they pierced the perimeter of the Heligoland Bight. When the bomber formation finally broke from the clouds upon the vicinity of the Jade Estuary and Wilhelmshaven, they finally met heavy resistance. However, the bombers fended off the attack and inflicted considerable damage on the German ships. At 1.10 p.m., the RAF formation encountered heavy flak from positions 214, 244, and 264 as they flew over the mudflats near Cuxhaven and Besamunda. Soon, they were engulfed by anti-aircraft fire from all directions, including from the naval ships in the dock. Meanwhile, German fighters could be seen taking off from a camouflage airstrip at Schilling Point. As the RAF bombers did everything in their power to avoid the fire, they knew the fighters would hit in any moment, and the tension in the air became overbearing. The pilots kept a watchful eye on the skies, and suddenly, a swarm of German Messerschmitt Bf-109s appeared on the horizon. Disaster The pilots braced for impact as the two sides hurtled toward each other, the sound of gunfire and the whine of engines filling the air. The battle was intense and chaotic, with planes weaving and diving as they tried to outmaneuver each other. The British bombers fought bravely, trying to fend off the relentless Germans and fighting to keep their tight formation amidst the severe attacks from the ground and from the air. The RAF 149th Squadron was the only section to drop bombs on top of the ships in Wilhelmshaven Harbor, but with unclear results. Then, as the bombers emerged from the anti-aircraft fire, the formation became increasingly more disorganized, which made the bombers easy prey for the German fighters. 
Luftwaffe pilots Johannes Steinhoff and Wolfgang Falk led the attacks on the bombers, with Steinhoff claiming two hits and Falk claiming four. Other German pilots, including Helmut Lent and Rolf Kaltrak, also made successful attacks. In total, the RAF lost 12 bombers and 57 men during the botched operation, more than half of its original force. Meanwhile, the Germans only lost two fighters and suffered 41 casualties among the sailors in the warships, which sustained light damage and no sinkings. After the debacle, the remaining RAF bombers retreated and returned to their bases in England. Both sides eventually claimed victory. The British cited the damage they inflicted on the port as evidence of their success, but they knew they had suffered a devastating defeat. It also became clear that sending unescorted bombers to enemy territory was a suicidal endeavor. From that day on, the RAF radically shifted their approach to airstrikes, opting for night attacks instead of daylight offensives, and entirely scrapping the philosophy of the bomber will always get through that had previously been their rule of thumb. Thank you for watching Dark Skies. To uncover more legendary war stories forgotten by time, subscribe to our channel and hit that notification bell. Also, don't hesitate to click on your screen and check out our other Dark Documentaries channels, where we explore impressive battles and modern wartime technology. Stay tuned.